that those allegations were quite surprising to me. Um, but given that this committee is a committee of record, what I can say really is that as I found those allegations as quite surprising uh, because um, with the greatest of respect, they did not, uh, they were not founded on any basis. But fortunately for me, Mr. Chairman, um, this committee is a committee of record and therefore I have in my hand here the report of Shraj in respect of those allegations made against me and my colleague, Honorable Asenso Boachi. Honorable Member, let me be clear. A matter has gone to Shiraj already? That is correct. Determined? That is correct. Very well. That is All correct. Right. So, 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 Mr. Chairman, yes, the, Mr. Chairman, following those allegations, and those allegations were um, made by um, A+. Plus, I mean, so there's a Shraj report yes, that Shraj. has exonerated you. Yes, That's what Chairman wanted to know yes, from you, exactly. as a matter of record. And I'm saying that I have the report here. And, and chairman, chairman uh, with your indulgence, what was the determination of Shiraj on those matters of allegation that bordered on your contact, conduct? Just refer to it. Thank what you. was the determination okay. of Shiraj? So, so, and then the date. That, that, Share with us the date. Thank you, Chair. I will do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have in my hand the report of Shrag dated 4-12-2017 with reference number CHRAJ-322-2017-4-12-2017 titled in the matter of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice and in the matter of allegations of corruption, thievery, and abuse of power between Dynamic Youth Movement of Ghana complainant and Mr. Samuel A. Jinapo and Mr. Francis Asenso Buachi, respondent. Mr. Chairman, the report is detailed. I won't go through all of it, but it essentially does a thorough analysis of the respondent's position, the complainant's position. It took evidence. The evidence were analyzed by Shraj and of significance to me and, and, and hopefully to this committee, is the conclusion of Shraj. And Mr. Chairman, the conclusion of Shraj can be uh, found at paragraph 12, titled Decision. And this was the decision of Shraj. Quote, the commission is satisfied that the evidence does not support the allegations of corruption and abuse of power against Mrs. Samuel A. Jinapo and Mrs. Asenso Puachi the two deputy chiefs of staff. The allegations could not be substantiated whatsoever. Accordingly, this complaint is hereby dismissed as being without merit and totally unwarranted." End quote. Thank you. Chairman, just the, you said evidence was taken. Was evidence taken from A plus that you are aware of by Shiraj in this matter? Ye yes, evidence was taken from Mr. A plus. You think that it was just uh, malicious on the basis of the finding of Shiraj that uh, probably just growth? Is that your thinking? Well, Mr. Chairman, I respectfully think that um, on the back of the ruling, the determination of Shiraj, those allegations were totally unwarranted, they were baseless. I have right. absolutely no doubt about Thank it. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the nominee at a very young age, became the deputy chief of staff. Having gone through this trauma, and you know in politics, this political enterprise, all we have is our individual image. How did you cope with this trauma of you being tainted? Especially when Shraj eventually exonerated you. Within that period, how did you cope? Well, Mr. Chairman, I should say it was difficult. It was very difficult. And especially, I'm sure that many of the members of this committee will um, attest to how it feels when you are maligned, when an allegation is made against you which is unfounded. I mean, especially when 
the whole country and the media picks it up. And we all recall how major it was in this country. And um, it generated a lot of controversy. So it was difficult, I must, I must admit. And now I personally was particularly relieved and uh, thankful that the matter finally was tabled before Shraj. And Shraj delved into it and, and, and came to these firm um, conclusions. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a very difficult matter. Chairman, final on my woman. Um, your brother, your blood brother, is a member of the NDC and a member of this house. You are a member of the MPP fraternity. You hold a high position. You're going to hold a very high position now. And no doubt in the previous administration, uh, your deputy chief of staff, very high position. How do you, with the political differences between you and your brother, how do you manage the seeming uh, political conflict, if I should put it? Oh, is there peace at home? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's a question I've had to answer many, many times. Well, first of all, with respect, uh, Honorable Leader, the assumption is that we live in the same home. We don't. I'm a married man with four children. He's a married man with three children. How long have you been married? I have four children. <laughs> I have four girls. How long have you been married? <laughs> I, have you been married? <laughs> I did triplets, you know, at the goal. So, I, uh, we live very independent lives. And what I can say is just in two folds. First, first is that I can say that for myself and I can say that for him that we are both very, very committed to our respective political parties. I don't intend to go further than that. We are very, very committed. He is, um, he is strongly uh, committed to his party. I'm probably more committed to my party. And we are also very cordial. I mean, we are cordial as any siblings anywhere can be. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I would want to end with this comment. On the 9th, 7th of uh, January, that unfortunate incident on the house floor, I noticed that your, your brother was heated up. You were also heated up. But at the point that two of you uh, got on and he went to his side and the turbulence was coming down, and you also gave a word on our side. I hope that with your explanation given as to the cordial relationship that exists between the two of you, in spite of political differences, in times of trouble, the two of you would help calm waters in this house floor for the benefit of this country. I hope I can have the assurance of you. Mr. Chairman, the leader can have the assurance. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, let me have a bite of the deputy leader's uh, warm-up. You are deputy chief of staff. Is that the case? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. What was your schedule and activities or probably responsibilities in the office of the president as deputy chief of staff? Mr. Chairman, as we all do know, the Constitution vests executive powers in the president. And the president is a repository of executive powers in our country. He exercises that mandate through the office of the chief of staff. So, Chairman, if you want, the interface between the presidency and the world is normally through the office of the chief of staff. The president is dealing with his ministers, he's dealing with the world, he's dealing with chiefs, uh, parliament, organs of state. The chief of staff's office is the, inter is the interface 
between the presidency and the world, as well as the discharge of the executive mandate of the president. So I understood my work very clearly from the outset. And those were the instructions the president gave me on that important day when he invited me to his office to inform me that he was going to appoint me as deputy chief of staff. The instruction was very simple. You are to assist the chief of staff. And Mr. Chairman, for the four years that I was in that office, my schedule was to assist the chief of staff. And the chief so of there staff were no specific schedules or responsibility mm -hmm. like you are responsible for port activities related to the port, you are not responsible for foreign delegations. There probably must have been a specific role. Yeah, yeah there were. There was. The, the Speak to that. Yes, I was, the chair. I was deputy chief of staff in charge of operations. And deputy chief of staff in charge of operations essentially, and I will continue to use the word assist because the back stops with the chief of staff. The deputy chief of staff in charge of operations essentially is to assist the chief of staff to first of all run the presidency itself, Jubilee House, ju the workings of Jubilee House. And Mr. Chairman, I know the Honorable Minority Leader is even more experienced in the issues of the governance of our country than I am. The presidency itself is a whole enterprise. Uh, how the office runs, the issues involved there, uh, cabinet issues, policy matters, monitoring, evaluation, following up. If the president was, for instance, to set up committees of ministers, you are involved in it. And, and the general, if you want, running of the country, the president runs the country, the chief of staff assists him to run the country. I assist the chief of staff to assist the president to run the country. So, Chairman, I get it from the nominee that he only assisted the chief of staff and the president. May I now take you to the world of lands and forestry? And with respect, Chairman, may I refer the nominee with your indulgence to Article 268, 1 and 2 of the 1992 Constitution and to solicit what his views are on those provisions and how he intends to walk the law on those matters. Article 2681 provides any transaction, contract, or undertaking involving the grant of a right or concession by or on behalf of any person, including the government of Ghana, to any other person or body of persons, howsoever described, for the exploitation of any mineral, water, or other natural resource of Ghana made or entered into after the coming into force of this constitution shall be subject to ratification by parliament. So watch my words there. Subject to ratification by parliament. Then 2682 provides, parliament may, by resolution supported by the votes of not less than two thirds of all the members of parliament, exempt from the provisions of clause one of this article, any particular class of transaction, contract, or undertaking. Once you are a lawyer, it means that you studied interpretation. What is your understanding of this constitutional provision, and what obligation does it impose on you as probable minister for lands and forestry? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I'd like to make the point that a careful examination of Chapter 21 of the National Constitution will clearly reveal the importance the framers of the Constitution places on the lands and natural resources of our country. Mr. Chairman, if I may, the lands and natural resources of our country is the only sector which is found expressions in almost all the national constitutions of our country from 1969 to 1979. There was a full chapter in the 1969 constitution dedicated to lands and natural resources. So was there a chapter in the 1979 constitution dedicated to the lands and natural resources of our country. Mr. Chairman, so the reason, my thinking, is that the framers of our constitution seems to 
have placed such importance on the lands and nature resources of our country is because by all intents and purposes, the lands and natural resources of Ghana constitute the property of the Ghanaian people vested in their president to be held in trust for the benefit of the Ghanaian people. And therefore, Mr. Chairman, Article 268, in, in my view, then ensures that given that the lands and natural resources constitute the property of this country, Parliament becomes the accountable body for the utilization and management of the lands and natural resources of our country, which is why the grant of a mineral right will require parliamentary ratification. And, Mr. Chairman, respectfully, my conceptual interpretation of it is that the natural resources belong to the Ghanaian people. It's their property. It's vested in their president to, um, to deal with or deal in for their benefit. Parliament, pursuant to Article 268, then becomes the accountable body or state for the utilization of the mineral resources of our country. So if the president, through his Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, grants a mineral right, the framers of the Constitution requires that such a grant be brought before Parliament. So Parliament can, can cross the T's, can, can hold the I's, and will be satisfied that, as representatives of the people, their property in the mineral resources of our country are being dealt with properly. Mr. Chairman, if I may add, if I may conclude by adding that the Supreme Court got the golden opportunity to speak to or make a pronouncement on this requirement of ratification. And this was done, Mr. Chairman, in the case of Republic, Republic versus High Court, General Jurisdiction, Sex Accra, S Party Attorney General, Eston, Eston, Eston Quebec Group Limited, Interested Party. Mr. Chairman, and in that case, the gravamen of the issues before the court was whether or not a grant of a mineral right without parliamentary ratification will, will, be, will, be, will, be, will be deemed uh, valid. The Supreme Court, Mr. Chairman, per the highly respected judge, uh, Justice Mafusa, said this, and I, I just will seek your permission to read the exact holding of the Supreme Court, and I quote, they said, the intention of subjecting any transaction involving the exploitation of any, involving the exploitation of any mineral to parliamentary ratification was to ensure that such transaction had received the approval of the actual owners of the mineral, the people of Ghana. Such approval expressed through their representatives in parliament as engineered by the constitution, end quote. So, Mr. Chairman, I think the, the matter is clear. I mean, you, we, we, all right. you, you have to... In, yes, in that you same to. clause, you'll find for the exploitation of any mineral, comma, water, or other natural resource. So, water is put in the class of minerals, minerals and natural resource. Today, there's a driller at the a new social center I'm constructing at the Quai, drilling water now. Between September and now, I've drilled boreholes, mechanized boreholes, about 50 of them in my constituency. Are they invalid? Because I did not get, <laughs> not just parliamentary <laughs> approval, I didn't get any concession from anybody. We just put the uh, rig at the location and we drill. Is water in this clause? What is the uh, drilling of water? Should it be construed the same way as we construe uh, minerals and uh, other natural resources? Mr. Chairman, um, first of all, water is under the Water Resources Commission, which is not an agency under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. I, I should also respectfully submit that the remit of natural resources as construed 
in Ghana and under our constitution is a matter that I'm not sure I will have the final say because there's a lot of discussion about it. Petroleum resources, for instance, are, are those natural resources. Uh, water resources are, they, are these natural resources. But for my purposes, the instructions from the president and hopefully if I'm fortunate to receive the recommendation of this house, of the recommendation of this committee and the approval of the house, uh, I, I will keep to the quote that has been cut from, even that is such a big, a big load to carry. So, so we'll leave it at that. Except to add, Mr. Chairman, uh, finally, that the provision referred to by the Honorable Minority Leader, being Article 2682, I think that provision can be a bit of a saving grace. And I want to raise the matter of small-scale mining and whether or not there is a requirement for parliamentary ratification when mineral rights are granted under small-scale mining. Technically, and by, the, and by the confines of the constitutional provision, that yes, they should be. But is it practical? Does that help the industry? I think those are matters that we can discuss. Thank you. Chairman, I, but what Chairman raised, probably you can just say that when you get there, because you yourself, in your answer, you were emphatic, chapter 21, lands and natural resources, so don't run away under Water Resources Commission. What Chama referred to, Article 268, is within what you referred to in your chapter, but still there. May I now, Chairman, take the nominee to Article 257, 257. And it reads in one, all public lands in Ghana shall be vested in the President on behalf of and in trust for the people of Ghana. I know you, you are a royal, so you know what land politics means for the people in northern Ghana and every part of the country. But for my purposes, 2573 is what I want to seek your view on. For the avoidance of doubt, it is hereby declared that all lands in the northern, upper east, and upper west region, now, Mr. Speaker, by extension, I can add Savannah region, <laughs> of Ghana, which immediately before the coming into force of this constitution were vested in the government of Ghana are not public lands within the meaning of clause 1 and 2 of this article. What is your understanding of this? Mr. Chairman, my understanding of this provision is that the public lands of Ghana have been defined by the Constitution. The public lands of Ghana is defined, first of all, in Article 2572 of the National Constitution. The vesting of the public lands of Ghana in the President um, for the people of Ghana has also been well established in Article 2571. My understanding is very straightforward, Mr. Chairman. The framers of the Constitution intended that lands in northern, upper east, and upper west regions of Ghana, which immediately before the coming into force of this Constitution were vested in the government of Ghana, are not public lands within the meaning of clauses one and two. And so I, I would think, really, I mean, this, this can be, um, somebody can take this up at the Supreme Court, but from where I sit, I would think that uh, lands which were vested before the coming into force of the Constitution are automatically divested. Mr. Chairman, I should add, I should add that there is a whole arrangement and discussion and debate about vested lands. And in fact, Mr. Chairman, uh, this House, Parliament itself, having enacted Land Act 2020, Act 1036, makes a comment on vested lands. Makes a comment on vested lands. And Mr. Chairman, respectfully, and with your indulgence, Section 271, 2, and 3. Of, of Act 1036 speaks specifically about vested lands. And this is what it says. 
with your permission I read. Quote, 2701, the President shall, on the recommendations of the Lands Commission, authorize the divesting of any land which prior to the coming into force of the Constitution was vested in the President by any law. Two, within six months of the coming into force of this Act, the Lands Commission shall begin the process of evaluating all existing vested lands with a view to recommending to the President the divesting of those lands. And three, finally, the divesting of land shall be by executive instrument published in the, in the Gazette. End quote. Mr. Chairman, so what it means is that vested lands, whether they will be divested or not, will be determined within the confines of Section 270, 1, 2, and 3. It, it will be my view that the lands which were vested prior to the promulgation of the 1992 Constitution are exempted. But the question as to whether or not lands which were vested post-1992 will still be captured, uh, we, we, can, we can continue to have that discussion. I, I'm, I'm not too sure about how, how, how we can handle those. Chairman, it's noted. You've just referred to the Lands Act, which was passed by Parliament Act 1063. Now, investors complain about the process, uh, tortuous, cumbersome process of getting title to land, investors. Ghanaian businesses complain, and you know what title means. Even sometimes when you want to get a credit facility of a loan, you need to demonstrate ownership via title. Now, it has affected Ghana's rating in our ease of doing business. Just process of land and related matters of litigation, investors come in, the next day they have to be walking to court instead of their farms or the industry they purport to build. How will you use the new current lands law to improve Ghana's ease of doing business should you become minister? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think this is a very important question. And since my nomination, I've been reflecting on literally all the issues under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. And if I'm fortunate to receive the recommendation of this committee and the approval of Parliament and I assume office at the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Chairman, I want to submit that the implementation, the effective implementation of this new Lands Act, Act 1036, will go a great way of improving the administration of land in our country. Mr. Chairman, it's still a piece of legislation, yes. We will require to make sure that we publicize it. We have to get a country to be aware of it, to know about the implications of the provisions of this act. We must have a, a strategy and a policy to ensure that this act is well implemented. Mr. Chairman, I say this because I've taken some look at Act 1036. And I should respectfully commend Parliament for enacting this law. My view, my view, Mr. Chairman, is that literally all the thorny, difficult issues relating to land administration seems to have been, uh, this Act seems to have intervened in almost all of them. And if you take a look at the Act, it's far reaching, it's detailed. It, for instance, in part one. Oh, Chairman, I appreciate it. Far reaching, detailed. Will you reduce the number of days that it takes any Ghanaian or investor to acquire title to land should you be approved as minister? Mr. Chairman, I will endeavor to do that. And I endeavor to do that through threefold. One, the implementation of this um, Act 1036. Because a, 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 an effective enforcement of this act itself. I mean, as you know, Mr. Chairman, the issues of stool, skin, clan, family, uh, people who have interest in land, the requirement for them to demarcate their land, register it at the Lands Commission to avoid a double sale, the issues relating to 
uh, whether a couple can sell land by himself or by herself, all of those issues are tackled in there. So the effective implementation of this act will help. Digitizing the operations of the land administration, lands commission is key, and decentralizing the operations and services of the lands commission. I think this three-prong approach, one, the implementation of this act, two, Chairman, the uh, nominee, are you the one, are you the one to decentralize lands commission or the chapter the chapter you refer to deals with it because you already have regional lands commission, that is you true. have uh, national lands commission, which are all creations of the constitution. But just to end here, Chairman, so that our colleagues can scrutinize our uh, the nominee. In your response to an earlier question by the deputy leader, you referred to the Exxon cubic ruling, and for your you quoted Mao Sao, respected justice of the Supreme Court, when he said that parliamentary ratification is an imperative. Should you get to the ministry, and it's brought to your attention that there are over 35 mining companies operating in Ghana without parliamentary ratification, what will you do? Mr. Chairman, I, I think the matters to do with Eastern, Eastern Kibik are beyond me. The Supreme Court has made a firm pronouncement on, on, on those. So that for me is a fair complete. Um, the matters of other mining rights or leases which have not been um, ratified, we, we have to find an expeditious way of, of making sure that they are, they, they are presented to Parliament. Will, will your expeditious way be that you declare them illegal or you come to Parliament to ratify it, what will you do? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman the, the, the ruling respectfully in the Eston, Eston Kibik was not entirely on the lack of ratification. The, 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 the basis for the holdings of the Supreme Court were not anchored on simply not ratifying. There were other reasons why... The what, what were the other reasons in your view, Chair? I think I have the brief here, and um, I, I, I can. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'll be more than happy to finish the committee with 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 a, with a judgment.